open the door for somebody else. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Vaccine Conversation Podcast with Melissa and Dr. Ba. That was way too quiet. About, welcome in, everyone, to the Vaccine Conversation with Melissa and Dr. Bob. Boo. Boo. I need one of those, like, like 7.0 versus the 10.0 signs for judges. Listen, you don't remember what it's like, but I have young children at home all the time, yes. and they are loud all the time. All the time. Right. Just to talk. Just to, like, say something, oh, they're yeah. loud. Everything's so loud. In fact... I'm thinking of bringing Justice in to get his hearing check because he's so loud. So because he's so loud and I don't have a preference for loud things, I'm assuming there are some people out there that also don't like loud things. Okay. And they probably, <laughs> as they've turned this up in their car or whatever, they probably don't want to hear somebody yelling, jumping in, going, welcome in to the next <laughs> conversation. <laughs> they probably would much rather hear a... Welcome to another episode of the exciting and data-driven podcast, The Vaccine Conversation. <laughs> so this is you after a long afternoon in the hot California sun. Protesting for our freedoms. Yes, yeah, this is honey. me. That's where I was today. I was at a protest um, rally gathering, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, of people with a ton of American flags. Uh, talking about reopening the economy, reopening California, a full reopen, because what we've found, what we found out this last week is uh, the little mm -hmm. breadcrumbs that we were thrown yeah. where everybody said, oh, it's going to be days, not weeks, huh, Gavin? Because everybody was protesting and he obviously understands he's losing hold over the citizens in this state. Uh, everybody's thinking, oh, okay, it's going to be Friday. Friday's the day. And then turns out, what he did instead was give a list of all these particular conditions that had to be met in order for that to happen. And guess what? No county will ever be able to meet that criteria. That right. criteria is no new COVID case out of 10,000 people, one case per 10,000 people in 14 days. Right. No yeah. death in 14 days. Um, and if one of those things happens, your clock starts all back over again. And then he also is forcing 1.5, which is so odd, but one to two people per thousand testing every single as a daily minimum. Mm. So they're encouraging the testing. What do you think the testing is going to find out? There's going to be a, maybe a positive case in there, right? right? And guess what happens when there's a positive case? Yeah. Start Let's start over. that clock all yeah. over again. So what he's basically saying is you're never going to open up. We're never going to actually open up. We can't get to phase two because we have this obstacle course we have to, uh, to get through that he has made purposely unattainable. Right. And they're now making all these decisions, not based on data, not based on medical advice, because medical advice, true scientific medical advice should be nonpartisan. Right. There's no, right. there shouldn't be such thing as Democratic medical advice and Republican medical advice. There should just be medical advice. So all the public health officers, all the epidemiologists, the infectious disease specialists, there, yeah, there, there's probably some room for disagreement. But if they're all sitting in a room together making medical, you know, scientific based policies based on uh, data, they would typically come, I think, to a consensus or some, some sort of agreement. So I don't see how um, the medical advisors that are advising our Democratic governor could give him such different, literally give him the opposite medical advice that, say, for example, the medical specialists in Texas right. are giving their governor right. or, or other states. Like, how could it be so, yeah, how different? Could it be so different? Well, yeah. what's funny is, like, I have this quote from, from our governor, so in California, Gavin Newsom, April 30th, says, the science, data, and public health will drive our decision, <laughs> our decision-making in staying closed. So that's what he said on a Thursday. All of a sudden, we had all these protests over the weekend again, and he realizes it's getting worse, not better. As far as the number of people showing up, there are more and more people. Four days later, four days later, he says, opening up the state has happened for only one reason. The data says it can happen. Hmm. So four days prior, he says the data is driving the decision to stay closed. Four days later, he says the, the data is driving the decision to open up the state. And I think what most people want to know is, 
whose data? Where are you getting this data mm-hmm. from? He has never shown anybody anything. Not even one time has he said, here's the information I'm getting and here's why I'm making my decision. He doesn't have to. And he's literally just saying this is science-based. But of course, we've got a lot of science that says otherwise. And I have to laugh. Can I read something that's kind of funny? Um, I don't know how many of you guys out there, your states have, you know, like four stage plan or four phase plan or six phase. And it's it's kind of like these um, long things that they're they're giving everybody to kind of say, well, we'll open up when, you know, these things happen. And um, ours was originally a six phase plan. Wow. It would, Then it was now a four phase plan, but now it's gone back to a big long list of criterium to even get to the second phase. So, I mean, it's honestly, it's a, it's a, beep show it's a beep show okay <laughs> not a peep show but a beep show thanks for um, inserting yes, the beep you're there welcome. So a Matt beep show there yeah. you go so I, somebody sent me this and i thought this was so funny that i'm going to read this this is not an actual quote but it could it might as well be okay so <laughs> i know what you're you know what i read okay yeah. but it's so funny we have a six phase plan to reopen the state the plan will be a phased plan that we will plan to utilize in phases. The phases will be planned and the planning will be phased. We will move quickly and slowly to open but remain closed. I have created a staff of staffers who will plan the phase and planning while phasing their phases. And that is our reopening plan. Thank you. <laughs> I th- I, I'm sorry. I thought that was awesome. so funny yes. because yeah. we you've seen it. It's going back and forth. Different states say one thing. How can the medical advice be so different? It's the same argument about masks. Our Surgeon General says, you guys stop buying masks. They don't work. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden it's like, oh, we have these ordinances that everybody's required yeah. to wear a mask. But I thought they didn't work. The World Health Organization says they don't work. We should do a separate episode on that because I'm okay. doing some data diving yeah. on that as yeah. well. But today... Yeah. Today. Can I tell people what our topic is? <laughs> you can. You sure can. <laughs> no. But no, heads up, heads tell. up. He didn't find this article. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now introduce it. <laughs> so the article that I found during all my research <laughs> <He's lying. laughs> um, is, is called, um, it's from the Saskatchewan Herald. That, okay, so that's fake news and misinformation is what you just said. The, two, the fact that he said he found this article is both fake news no, they know that. and misinformation. You don't need to tell I just them. Make sure. I just want to make sure. Our okay. listeners are, are smart. <laughs> right. So yeah, uh, so it comes from Canada. It's called Calls Come for Canada to Make COVID-19 Vaccine Mandatory for All Citizens. Okay, so when I saw this article... You know, we've heard a lot of people go, oh, mandatory vaccines. People are worried about Bill Gates. Um, In fact, we should break down that blog that he wrote and the the specifics in that that I kind of did in a post also, Mm -hmm. because that's interesting because that's data based. It's not this is not a conspiracy theory to say this is what Bill Gates said about the um, vaccine that he wants to develop and how it would work and who would get it. That's all data based. People can think this is like a conspiracy theory to sit there and say Bill Gates wants to vaccinate the entire world, but he literally said he wants to vaccinate the entire world. So a lot of people, um, a lot of people are saying, you know, the COVID vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine is going to end up being mandatory. And and they've been talking about adult mandates for a while as we, as we kind of see the writing on the wall. But I've always seen things that have come across a little extremist to me. Mm-hmm. So th- th- it's never been something I wanted to really delve in because a- unless I saw the steps to go there by regulatory agencies, then, then I'd want to cover it. And so when I read this article, this really felt to me like this has been planned out very strategically because as we will read to you, they have the steps, exactly how they're going to do it. And they say it in such a calm way. But what they're saying is something everybody should be extremely worried about. Right. And, And I've always thought, well, let's just wait until they come out with a vaccine before I even research it or try to understand it or figure out what's going on. And let's wait until they try to pass a mandatory law on this vaccine before we take any action. And that is such the wrong approach. We need to be standing up now because you're right, they're setting the stage to make the public uh, want the vaccine to be mandatory. They want to sell you on the idea that, you know, we don't even, you know, okay, maybe we'll make it mandatory, but it's because you, the public, want us to make it mandatory and that they're they're trying to set us up for that. So we need to get politically active now 
again, not wait for this to actually become bill, you know, become a oh, bill right. in your state. The time is now. It's time to, to start rising up to start talking to your legislators about mandatory COVID vaccination. And I, and I want to, as an aside, um, I recently took several days to compile. I can't believe how many articles, I know. right? As, that was crazy. So I narrowed it down. <laughs> Isn't that sad? I narrowed it down to 100 posts that I have done on COVID since early March or very, very late February, I forget. Um, and I had to narrow it down because it's not as sexy to say 107 posts <laughs> or 112 <laughs> posts. So I had to get it to an even 100. And they're a combination of uh, our Facebook Lives, um, some memes and quotes, and also some informative posts where you really, where I really bro you know, broke down some data and had in the comments all the sources and links. So it's a lot of good information. And I hope we can, I can find a way to put it on our website too, just so that it can be like accessible with all the links um, oh, yeah. under one yeah. side tab, under kind of maybe by my truth post. So I'll kind of have like a little side tab so that if Facebook it's really yeah. hard to go through somebody's news yeah, feed. Yeah, like we put a COVID you know, topic. Yeah, you because know. the problem yeah. is is uh, when you post that frequently over this kind of stuff, you have to scroll down so far to get to stuff. Yeah. So even compiling this took me days. But it reminded me I came across a post about how Denmark had already passed a law to mandate the vaccine for mm. coronavirus okay. or COVID-19 uh, before that vaccine had ever even happened. Right. So People like to think, oh, they're not going to do that. But it's like some of these laws are literally already being adjusted now before the actual vaccine is out. And that's something we should be concerned about. But whether or not this is about COVID or anything else, what we're about to read to you step by step shows how a government can take control of its people by mandating a medical procedure and what things they will take away from you if you will not comply. So whether this was for coronavirus or the flu or uh, one of the childhood vaccinations on the schedule, the process in which they go about this is very troublesome to me. Mm -hmm. And when I read it and saw how detailed it was and exactly the different examples of ways they were going to take away freedoms and rights and um, impose on your own being or your own child's being, uh, I think this really is a wake-up call Uh and especially because there's a different angle with this one that we haven't heard before, which is yeah. a lot more political. Yeah. And this was written by the Saskatchewan Herald staff. So you've seen like editorial staff or the mm -hmm. editorial board of a newspaper, like the Orange County Register right. editorial board. They wrote a, kind of a somewhat similar piece regarding the SB 276 in California, basically declaring as a newspaper board you know, the leaders of this newspaper, here's our opinion mm -hmm. on this topic. And we're, it's not just someone writing an opinion piece. It's not just one person. Right, it's but it's a whole staff like who, who controls the tone and the political you know, tone of a newspaper. They're, they're the ones that are coming out with this. I was going to say there's a risk too to most people that are viewing an article, especially online. They're not looking that it's an opinion article or an editorial. Right. They see Orange County Register or LA Times or New York Times. And if they see what they see that follows that, they're going to go, there's an article in the New York Times as if that is news and basic reporting. A lot of times people don't even stop to go, wait, this is an opinion or this is an editorial. And I don't think right. today's you know, generation of people like the younger generations, they don't, I don't think they understand what that means. The difference between an editorial and right. a regular article from a news organization. Right. And I guess with today's climate, there really isn't much of a difference. <laughs> yeah. It really is all kind of yeah. one and the same, but we're going to break this article down for you. Uh, it's not very long, but we're going to kind of go we're gonna section by section, long. but we're going to make it so long. It's going to be like a <laughs> four hour breakdown of three paragraphs. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, Are you though? I'm not really kidding. So I'll tell you, uh, the beginning of this whole thing is about coronavirus is now, you know, we have millions of cases and the deaths are going into um, the hundreds of thousands across the world. Okay, so again, the beginning of this is scary because we've got this huge pandemic. So that's, they want to set the stage. Mm -hmm. and, and I did a, a fake news article breakdown on my on my page about this because you have to be really careful when you read articles. Look at the headline, look at the first two paragraphs, look at the photo that they include. Every single one of those things is designed to make you feel something about the topic. It's designed to make you um, 
make certain associations, and it's designed to place blame somewhere. And it's really manipulative and dangerous the way that reporting has gone there. And so pay attention when you're reading articles. Pay attention to the headlines. Pay attention to the first couple paragraphs. So the very first line says, as the COVID virus now counts millions of victims. Okay, we're, now he, whoever wrote this, the, the board is just talking about cases, but they're victims. But when you think of victims, what do you think of? Hospitalized, stricken, or harmed, dead. You know, dead, you know, dead people. Right. Victim of a shooting. Right. When you use the word victims, these right. are people who have been greatly damaged, harmed, or killed. Right. Of course, ninety nine percent of the victims right. of COVID simply had minor cold symptoms and never even knew they had. The virus. Right. And so it says victims, it says deaths into the hundreds of thousands. So right at the beginning, it's kind of telling you what you want to think about this. This is so, so dangerous and so scary. Therefore, the next stuff that comes is not going to be so bad, right? Because we're talking about something so scary. And I love the next phrase. They, they talk about the virus, you know, killing people and all these victims. And they blame the virus along with making a secondary casualty of the global economy, which, which is brilliant writing, I got to mm. say. They say the virus is not only killing people and causing in all these victims, the virus is to blame for the for the downturn of our global for economy. For killing the economy. Yeah, it's the virus's fault. Mm -hmm. And that is so far from the truth. Right. The cause of the downturn of our global economy was our response to the virus. Sure. Policy. The virus, yeah, the virus mm -hmm. had nothing to do with it. It was not a direct cause at all. It was, uh, you know, most of our world's response to the virus, you know, Sweden's taking, you know, a, a less strict response and other places did as well. And, and their economies are not going to suffer as, as, as much. And in the United States, we all got together and shut down. But now certain states are going to open up faster and, and, you know, reach reopening more completely, uh, more quickly. And they're not going to be as affected. But places such as California, we are going to be a massive casualty as mm -hmm. far as our global, as far as our state oh, economy yeah. goes, we're going to be one of those casualties. And I love how these authors blame it on the virus, not blaming it on our governors right. or blaming it, it on our leaders. And that's brilliant. Of it them. wasn't that, the that, action right. that we took. It yeah. was just, this is a, a unfortunate byproduct, yeah, yeah, yeah. but isn't that kind of like what happens anytime you want to deflect the blame, right? Like, oh, a pharmaceutical product has unintended consequences for some, which means they are these, this is collateral damage. Mm -hmm. These are people that are victims of something, but it's not because we have this aggressive childhood vaccine schedule that's mm -hmm. causing that. It's just because they're unavoidably unsafe, right? right? right. You, you come to these phrases and it's trying to, to get you to feel a certain way about it. But in case some people are wondering what other economies have survived this well, because um, we all know that Sweden didn't go into lockdown. And we think that that's kind of the only one. But there are actually lots of other countries that did not go into full lockdown, or if they did, it was a very, very short, and therefore their economy has uh, been able to maintain itself. And that includes South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, a lot of the Asian countries that were next to the original outbreak. Um, we're able to kind of keep their economies going through all of this. So they don't have the casualty uh, of their global economy, the global economy problem, because they're, yeah. they're continuing. It almost makes it okay if you are a casualty. So again, it's totally. not our leader's fault. It's the virus's fault. It's just, it's too bad. And it's what's the solution? What's the world's best chance and to so, get through this? Yeah. So what they say um, right away is the race to discover and produce a vaccine. So, you know, a race that, that always feels to me like we're on this path to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. We need heroes to come together. Yeah, don't you dare slow us down. Don't slow no. us down. Yeah. And this is the most important thing. In fact, in, in Bill Gates's blog, one of the really scary quotes that he said was governments need to find the money to make vaccine factories. So wow. he actually talks yeah. about every country needs to make vaccine factories, exact words, to produce the COVID vaccine just for that. And he said, it's going to, of course, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and every government needs to find a way to find that money. And, and you know, I was thinking to myself as I was reading that, where are they going to get it from? Just like you just right, read, right. our economies have all crashed. 
we're all going to barely be able to survive as it is. Where is this extra money going to come from to build vaccine factories? By the time that's all done, this would have passed through the population and the outbreak will be over. But it's just I find it really interesting when I see stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the race is for the, the vaccine. And it says a successful vaccine is the world's best chance to stop the virus and return to a degree yes. of normality. Yeah. Uh, this is the new normal, right? To come to this, how do we get back to normal? Bill Gates said it in his thing. The only way we get back to normal is with a vaccine until every person in the world is vaccinated. That's how we'll get back to normal. Right. And, you know, this again is the opinion of the, the Saskatchewan Herald staff. You know who has an opposite opinion? Hmm. The U.S. Surgeon General, he was quoted mm. like about two months ago saying, we will not solve the coronavirus crisis with a vaccine. Right. It'll be solved by good public health measures, hygiene, you know, uh, appropriate social distancing. We'll solve it like we've solved every other health crisis. Because there you know. isn't time. There right. isn't time to get a vaccine mass distributed uh, in time to solve it. It's going to have to do what, like you're saying, what viruses do, which is go through the community. Right. And I think a lot of doctors have been saying that, which is why a lot of doctors and epidemiologists have been talking about herd immunity as the only real solution. It's, they're, they're saying this is not a possible solution. It's the only solution. Yeah. yeah. People have always been talking about how we need to get, we need to create natural herd immunity right. to protect all the vulnerable and the elderly. It's going to occur through natural herd immunity, exactly not vaccine-induced mm -hmm. herd immunity. And that's key. But this article disagrees. This article oh, well. says the answer, again, is vaccine-induced. Right. Immunity. But the only time an article does that is when they're looking for high levels of compliance. Right. So yeah. w whenever, like the New York Times had an article about compliance, they need 95% compliance for a COVID vaccine in order for it to work. That's what they said. This is last week. This is the same thing we've seen in California when they're passing laws saying the reason we need to take away exemptions right. is because we need 95% compliance to create herd immunity in order for the vaccine program to work, right. in order to keep these outbreaks. The only time they mention herd immunity is when they are telling everybody almost every single person needs to get this. It's not going to work otherwise, right. which is which I find really funny because, again, we know that number is 95 percent when it talks about vaccine induced herd immunity, which is a made up number, which is People made up number need to realize that. Right? And then everything that we've seen from other countries talking about herd immunity as it relates to the virus in the population. Every single other person has said 60, 65, maybe 70 percent. And now there is a new theory out that perhaps mm -hmm. we might only need 10 to 20 percent population coverage to prevent outbreaks not to make it go away completely but to prevent outbreaks right. and protect the vulnerable right. so you're looking at numbers like 10 20 60 70 you're never looking at numbers of 95 have you ever heard a doctor or epidemiologist say that 95 percent of our population needs to get infected with a virus to stop an outbreak I've never heard it one time ever. Mm -hmm. And then when this whole thing started in February, we've got the UK. They were the first ones to come out and make you know global international news to say, we need the herd immunity model to work here. We're going to need about 60% of everybody in the UK to get this, to move on. And, to get and the disease. To get the actual right. infection because right. there was no vaccine. Obviously, this is brand new. Uh, and then, of course, they got destroyed on this idea and they backtracked and changed their course. But never once. Now we're talking about these are this is the chief scientific advisor. Never once are they saying we need 95 percent of all the British and Scottish and Irish people to get this because they know better. They know you don't need 95 percent to mm -hmm. get something. And the reality is the only reason they say that with vaccines is because vaccine induced immunity is not providing the same level of coverage right. because we've got. But like I've mentioned before, primary vaccine failure, secondary vaccine failure, secondary vaccine failure is waning immunity. It doesn't work for everyone with a live virus vaccine. It's not working for subsets of the population. They cannot control their response the way that natural immunity works. Right. And so they just, like you said, randomly shoot out this number to say everybody has to do it or it's not going to work. Right. And you don't want to be one of those people responsible for no, not making it not. work. Nope. And so here comes the level of shame. Here comes the level oh, of yeah. manipulation yeah. and that feeling that it's your moral and social responsibility to 
to get this vaccine. It doesn't matter. Nowhere in this article do they talk about how it's untested. Nowhere in this article do they talk about how they went to human trials before animal trials. Nowhere in this article do they talk about how they've had no success with any coronavirus vaccine. Uh, nobody's talking about that. So they just want you to take this untested risk because it's your social and moral responsibility. And they're learning that that weighs heavier on people than the data. Because some people don't yeah. pay attention to yeah. data. That's not how their brain works. But what they do pay attention to is the fact that oh, you could be responsible for this catastrophe, never ending. And it's your fault. You you had the power and you chose not to do it. And now look what's happening. And it, to me, that kind of feels like the argument they use with social distancing. Like if social distancing works, then it's, you see, this is what we needed to do. And if we, it, the numbers would have been so much higher if we didn't do it. And if social distancing doesn't work, then they go, you guys didn't do it good enough. You didn't, you didn't do a good right. enough job. Right. If you would have done more, then the numbers wouldn't have gone where they, it's a win-win situation for them. And you can see the same type of philosophy here. Let me shame you for not complying. And you're going to be, it's going to be on your back. Like you're going to be the one that's responsible for this, right. not the, the people in charge, these regulatory agencies, not our government. It's going to be your fault. I'm surprised this is in the second paragraph of the article. They just jump right into it. The idea about conservatives are, are the, the side of this debate that are going to mess everything up. You know, they say the um, health analysts are concerned that large numbers of badly informed citizens with conservative beliefs who are refusing to believe in science and accept vaccinations could thwart the needed herd immunity. That makes a broad scale vaccination program effective. You just, we just, you know, touched on the herd immunity, but I think the, the even bigger aspect of, of this article there is the, the use of the word conservative there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never seen that before. You haven't? Mm -mm. Right. You know what? I don't think I have either. It's, um, I mean, people have started to talk about this. And in fact, I started to think about this even a couple months ago when this all started. I, I said, you know, this is going to turn into a political battle. You know, Republican versus Democrat, but it's you could also look at it as conservative versus liberal. Mm -hmm. And those two sides, they, they they pretty much divide almost every nation in half, I would say. I'd say half of a nation is going to be conservative and half uh, are going to be liberal. And it's interesting that the that they're sort of teaming up the conservative side with those who don't um, want mandatory vaccinations, those who are you know anti -ma vaccine mandate those who are, you know, in favor of pushing for better vaccine safety, that they're siding us with the conservatives, but they're also now saying almost like all conservatives are anti-science. Yeah, they don't believe science. Um, it's only the liberals that, you know, the liberals that are going to be progressive and move us forward into the next century with, you know, science as, as our God, and then that's going to lead the way. And so we need to give government all the power and all the control because they're going to use the science to, to get us there. And I think this is a wake up call to conservatives everywhere. Could even be independence right? because people that don't aren't completely on one side or the other, but are looking to, to go based on the issue mm -hmm. based on, or whoever's running and based on the person and what they stand for. The fact that they're dividing it into two different things like this, and they're making it seem like the people on this side don't know how to read science. They don't have valid opinions. Their belief system's flawed in general. It's a very general right, statement. Right. And over here, these are the only ones that make sense. That should be infuriating for everybody, Like, but especially people that are independent or conservative, because you should be able to have your own belief system and whether or not you agree with me or not doesn't make one of our viewpoints, you know, more or less valid based on whether or not it aligns with what's popular or if it aligns with who's making the laws. And, yeah. and you know, speaking of the law part of it, one thing that anybody knows in the United States is uh, all the bills that came out to remove exemptions uh, were all put out by Democratic legislators. And the only legislators, whether that was in the Assembly or the Senate, who stood up for parental rights, stood up for parents who had concerns with vaccine injured children 
and uh, stood up for this idea of government overreach when it comes to legislating medicine were Republican legislators. And um, this was, I've said this before, this was the first time I had ever seen myself personally align with Republican viewpoints because I was always a Democrat, always considered myself a liberal. I was a little surprised. Uh, thrown, been thrown into this world of, um, you know, medical freedom and informed consent. I was a little surprised that Democrats were the ones who were not acknowledging the victims of vaccine injury, considering mm -hmm. they are the party of victims. They are literally the party yeah. who acknowledges those who are left behind. And we've gotten, like you have said so eloquently, uh, the largest group of disabled children that are invisible, the largest group of invisible disabled or discriminated against children are those that have had these injuries and they're being completely ignored. And worse, they're being um, mocked and discriminated against and segregated. Um, but we have seen Republicans as the ones who, who stand up against medical mandates. And so that's kind of the preface, I think, for all of this is that that's where the great divide started over the last five mm -hmm. or six years. As yeah. it relates to laws across this country, you pretty much knew if your legislator was Republican, they were going to be voting against a medical mandate bill. Um, and so obviously both sides have science. So why is that the case? And you start to see that there are some types of party line political agendas that we've seen. So what's interesting with coronavirus is when COVID came along, we saw the same divide happening between liberals and conservatives about the issue in general. Mm -hmm. Not for the first couple of weeks. The first couple of weeks, everybody was kind of scared, thinking right. like right. we were all united in this, right? We're all in this together. That's their, mm -hmm. their favorite. Yeah, this yes. famous phrase. But then a, a few weeks that had gone by after that, when people started to realize, wait a second, this isn't sort of, they're extending lockdowns, businesses are starting to fail, I'm not able to feed my family, the numbers aren't there, uh, what's going on with the economy, like, all of a sudden there were questions. Yeah, yeah, but it's not just those questions, also, they started to realize they're allowing the government to control them in ways that they're uncomfortable with. Now the government is overreaching. Like for what? Like well, just what? just keep, keeping everything shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, putting up uh, police barricades mm -hmm. so people can't walk onto the grounds of their state capital or go to, to a protest. park. Or yeah. yeah, you can't literally walk along the beach. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you've been a surfer your whole life. I mean, it seems like a small thing to to shut down surfing, but if that's your way of life, say you're a hiker, say mm -hmm. you're a tennis player, say you're someone who likes to. Go, um, you know, row a boat on a lake every day for your relaxation. People start to realize when the government starts to shut down those basic daily mm -hmm. activities, literally, you know, activities of daily living, which is which is just how we all are, are humans, how we all find peace and quiet and relaxation. People and exercise, to, which yeah, is, is so important right. to your physical health. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I think people start to realize, hey, the government is taking all those things away for no reason at right. all. Absolutely not even a shred of good right. reason to take away no data, no any science of those behind things. that. Mm -hmm. They realize, hey, this isn't this isn't okay anymore. Yeah, maybe we had to shut down to slow things down briefly, but you know, government, you can't keep doing this. You're not gonna keep treading on us this way. We're now gonna rise up and, and let our voices be heard. But once those first couple weeks happened where the questions started coming. Uh, then it became a matter of where's the actual data? Let's look into the data. Let's mm -hmm. look into the numbers to see is there data there, or as you would say, are there data? Um, is the, is the information there? Are the hospitals overloaded? Is is this happening? What we're seeing on the news is this happening everywhere? Um, you know, why are we making decisions based on one area for everywhere else? And then there started to be, I started to see this big divide in the way everybody looked at this issue. And, and you started to see the difference in news networks, right? You had the Republican mm -hmm. and conservative news networks talking about how the data was not there to warrant this type of invasive government policy right. and that the economy is going to suffer along with all the secondary effects like unemployment, depression, mental health issues, abuse, alcoholism, all the other things that come as a result and an economic recession or depression. And then you've got another news network going – People are choosing money over lives. People are dying left and right. It's a war zone, you know, playing over and over the most obvious pictures of, you know, uh, healthcare staff in full PPE and making it look like this is like airborne Ebola is everywhere. And then 
that was one viewpoint and that was the liberal accepted you know, Democrat viewpoint. And it was just, it was really interesting as you saw the separation happen, the people protesting like where I was today, people would say most of them were probably conservative. Um, not everybody, because there are liberals that are upset with what's going on, obviously, but there's a lot of government overreach. The government has gone too far. They're taking away our constitutional rights. Right. And that's a conservative viewpoint. And we have now seen the country and the world separated into these two camps. I called this in what, in February, like team apocalypse. <laughs> this is what some, I saw somebody write and I thought yeah. that was really, you're either on team apocalypse or you're not. And at the beginning right. was that this is the deadliest virus to ever hit the earth and we all have to. Uh, sacrifice everything to, you know, try to contain it. Um, or there's the other side that says, we don't stop the world's economy for a virus. We cannot take away somebody's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which includes making a living to provide for their families and the mental health thing that they might need with being outside and all those things. So as we've separated, the protests are really showing who's upset with what's going on. And I feel like that's giving rise to this new focus mm -hmm. on calling out conservatives because usually an article like this would say anti-vaxxers right, right it would say the badly informed citizens that are anti-vaxxers that refuse to believe in science and accept vaccinations but this never mentions anti-vaxxers it says badly informed citizens with conservative beliefs what does that mean by the way and refusing to believe in science who's science that's what i always want to know mm -hmm. who's science because we know for a fact that there is science on both sides mm -hmm. and refuses to accept vaccinations when i see that i want to say how many how many doses mm -hmm. what do you consider acceptable to accept vaccinations. How many? You know, you can't say somebody just doesn't believe in vaccinations because the majority of people we we know are partially vaccinated. Uh, the majority of the country partially vaccinates. People that opt out of their flu shot, you didn't realize it, but you're partially vaccinating technically. Mm -hmm. And most children, even with exemptions, are partially vaccinated. So there are very few people that completely do not believe in vaccinations 100%. We know that right. statistically. Right. So they're connecting conservative beliefs now with a refusal to believe in science, any science altogether. You've got no intellectual capability if you have conservative beliefs, apparently. And um, if you don't accept vaccinations, just accept them, black or white, you either do or you don't. If you don't accept them, then you are one of these badly informed citizens. And, you know, all of these really like grand um, black or white categories that they label people in it just never makes sense on a complicated issue every one of these issues is complex right can you say somebody's right. always over here i mean i've had people message me like uh that go so so you hate all vaccines and i was like i've never said that <laughs> i've never i've right. never told a single person Never in my life have I told a single person to say, you should never get a vaccine ever in your life. What I say to everybody is what I truly believe, which is depends on the person, depends on the circumstance, depends on whether your baby's breastfed or not, if they stay at home or not, uh, depends on where you live. What's the prevalence of disease where you live? What's the circumstances, the child in daycare? You know, there, there are a lot of things to think about. I've never once just said, I don't believe in vaccines or everybody should never get a vaccine. Uh, I don't think that's my place to make that right, decision. Right. But what this article wants you to believe is you either believe in them or you don't. And guess what? If you believe in them, then that means you're signing up for this one too, because you need to do it for the country. Right. You need to do it for the world. It's your moral responsibility. Right. And, um, and it's pretty clear that they are setting the stage for it to feel very normal that we're all going to be required to have this vaccine. And um, I think it's so funny when they start out and go, calls have come. Yes. Calls have come. We don't know where these have come from yes. or who's made this call. But yeah. quote, calls have come for the vaccination once tested, available and safe to be made mandatory by Canada's federal government. I'm wondering who made the call. Was it like their friends? I know they, they don't it, say here. Was it their mom? <laughs> like, was this just three of their friends that they did a poll on? Because mm -hmm. you can't make a statement like calls have come for vaccination to become mandatory. I don't know that many people who would really support 
mandatory vaccination with anything, even people that fully vaccinate their children, even people that would consider themselves pro-vaccine, they would still not think a vaccine like this should be mandatory for all children and adults to get in order to be a part of society, as you say. Well, we'll, we'll see, though. You know, I, I think, you know, a lot of people can be just easily, you know, led, you know, led as sure. sheep, you know, uh, if if the government uh, paints it the right way. But that's only when they're fearful. And right. between yeah. now and the time that a vaccine comes out, people are going to be less fearful. Yes. They're going to have yeah. more of a trust in their body yeah. because they're going to realize, oh, yeah. my gosh, I didn't even realize I yeah. had it. But they're going to do antibody testing, find out maybe they had it and go, yeah. wow, yeah. I, I got through it. OK. All right. And yeah. they're going to trust the fact that immune systems can work a certain way. They're going to listen to the doctors and experts who have been coming out saying the mortality rates are not as high as, as they've been estimated and that more people have had this than we realize. This is not as dangerous for the majority of people. Uh, I think the more people get comfortable with that and less out of fear and panic zone, which was like the first two weeks, which is where yeah, everybody was yeah. really there. Yeah. If they could have had a vaccine then, in the yeah. first two weeks, yeah. I think a lot of people would have rushed out to oh, get oh, it. Oh, totally, totally. And you know what'll be interesting is a year from now when there is a vaccine, if if it comes out, uh, we'll have so much data and we'll have a better denominator in our right. equation. We'll know this many people died. Out, you know, even though the deaths are a little bit over overblown, sure. they're inaccurately reporting, but. But, you know, most of those are probably accurate deaths, I would say. Um, we'll know what the denominator is, so we'll be able to say, yeah, this disease killed one in, you know, 5,000 people that caught it. And maybe it killed, you know, one in 50 who are over 80 years old mm -hmm. or one in, you know, 100 who are severely obese. But in the general population, it killed one in 5,000 people. Or it might be one in 10,000 10, yeah. well, or we'll 20,000 for the, that under 50 right. healthy right. age range. And so I would love, I'm hoping and praying that the powers that be who have the authority to decide whether or not this should be mandatory, you know, that they will use data. That, that, that you're right, the fear by then will be gone. We'll now have data. We'll now make a scientific decision on who should get this vaccine and and whether or not it should be optional or whether it should be mandatory because we'll have much better data on it. Well, and, and did you hear recently like the sports league in New Zealand? Uh, they The, I don't know what he's called, I guess he's a type of prime minister, basically came out and said in order for them to go back to playing, they all have to get a flu shot. And you're like... We're talking about a different virus entirely, yeah, yeah. but it's going to be required that they get a flu shot. And then there were four or five major athletes that pushed back and said no, and they eventually yeah. released that now. Good. But the whole goal was to make everybody feel comfortable that they're taking steps for health. Let's get a vaccine for a different virus to make you feel more comfortable about this virus over here. If people don't understand like why that's so crazy, it's the equivalent of saying we have a measles outbreak, so everybody get your flu shot. <laughs> or we have a measles outbreak, so go get your chicken pox right, shot. Right. These are different viruses all together. Right. You can't take one vaccine and it's like to somehow positively affect your safety over here for another virus. It's just that's not how it works. Right. And what's funny about mandating the flu vaccine, as we've seen, We've got a poor safety risk profile. We have low, very low efficacy. Mm -hmm. To mandate one of the worst vaccines that we have already seems nonsensical to me. Right. right. Do you like that word? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It seems nonsensical because it's like, out of all vaccines they could pick, it's literally the worst one. And it and and yet they have found a way to mandate that in certain subpopulations right. already, which right. is mind boggling to me. Yeah, and and I heard I forget who wrote this, but I thought it was very brilliant that it's so ironic that the flu shot is is one of the only shots that is mandatory for certain like healthcare workers mm -hmm. in certain situations. It's so ironic, and, and, and but there's all this public pressure. There's shaming if you don't get a flu shot. It's so ironic that um, we've basically done pharma a huge favor by mandating and public shaming the least effective vaccine we have. The flu shot barely works. Oh my God, I know. Yet as a society, we shame everybody who doesn't get it and hospitals make it mandatory. We're essentially telling pharma, 
you can make a crappy product right. that barely works. Don't worry that it barely works. We're going to mandate it for everybody anyway. We're not going to require you to do more research and make a better flu vaccine. We should be using the natural market pressures and market forces mm -hmm. to force pharma to make a vaccine that really works. From a consumer standpoint. Yes. If everyone mm -hmm. stopped getting the flu shot because it barely works, what's pharma going to do? They're going to start making a better flu shot. Mm -hmm. But no, the government says we'll buy you know billions of dollars in flu shots from you every single year. So you have a guaranteed customer and we'll mandate it everywhere. So you don't have to make a better flu shot. Don't worry about it. And that is that boggles my mind. And I, I want to find out where, where I read that because I thought it was a, a great way to look at it. We, you know, people say, t people talk so much about uh, pharma corruption and pharma, you know, making a bad product or making a dangerous drug or a medical device that kills people. Yet we as a society are doing them an, an enormous favor by accepting the least effective mm -hmm. vaccine they make. So what are we as a society going to do with coronavirus vaccine? First of all, we don't even know if it's going to work very well. Let's say it's only as good as the flu shot is. Are we as a society going to get on board and help farmer out by mandating it and telling our legislators to mandate it and, you know, electing um uh, liberal legislators and liberal governors and liberal leaders that are going to mandate a vaccine simply because um, it's it seems like a good idea or you have to get on board for the public health. If this vaccine only has a 20% efficacy, are we as a so society going to sit back and, and allow that to happen or are we going to rise up? And it seems like so far, liberal you know organizations and liberal writers, liberal media, media mm -hmm are saying, yes, we are just going to sit back and let it happen. And so it's time for conservatives and independents and people who really trust science and data and freedom and trust our constitution. And critical thinking. Right. Yeah, yeah you're right. Are we going to stand up together? And um, this is what all of us in the um, vaccine safety movement have been trying to stand up for for many years. Mm -hmm. Now, half of America and half the world could join us because this is what we've been talking about mm -hmm. all along. And these are conversations you can have with your neighbors. You can say, um, it, you know, if you're, t if they're on board with you as far as the coronavirus narrative and they are conservative and their understanding of the narrative and they're willing to look at data, you can say, that's what I've been talking about with the mandatory vaccine narrative all these years. Now you finally get me. You understand me a little bit better. Let's let's work together to solve this coronavirus problem um, because we we now all you know ha we have half of America on our side on this issue. And what not to keep going back to Bill Gates, but I think it's interesting because he's he's really spearheading this effort for the coronavirus mm -hmm. vaccine. Um, what he did say was that most likely this vaccine is going to give a couple months worth of protection. Oh, and so in doing that, that's the same as the flu vaccine. For those who don't know, you typically have about 90 days of protection before your antibodies drop significantly. And again, that's for a match, if you even have a match, which most of the time you don't. So even for those it, quote, works for, you get that thing in September, you, it's not going to last, which is why you end up getting the flu in February anyway, and you wonder. And, and there has been some talk, maybe we should have twice a year flu vaccines. So this idea of a coronavirus vaccine only lasting you a couple months, what do you think that means, everybody? That means yearly coronavirus vaccines. And if that becomes mandated, now you're mandating this product every single year, not a one and done once in your lifetime type thing. And that every single dose of any vaccine is going to have risk for some mm -hmm. every single right. time right. there's risk. It's not like, oh, I had it two years ago, so I'm fine. It's like there could be risk maybe the fourth time that you have it, the fifth time. There's always a risk because it's a you know a pharmaceutical product like anything else. And um, I'm hoping the public will see through this, that if they have to get it, they might have been okay to get it once and they're good for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. If they have to get something every year, 
a lot of people have doubt in the flu vaccine for good reason. Right, right. Uh, it either they fi- they feel like they get sick more often when the years that they get it, um, or they don't think it works, or they got a, a terrible adverse reaction to or, it, or the data that show it, it increases your risk of other respiratory illnesses right. in subsequent years, which we've right. talked about, and and people are seeing that anecdotally true in their life, yeah, and yeah. so they have opted out of the flu vaccine. So those are the people that I think would say, man, and I was kind of afraid of COVID nineteen because of what the news said. But if I had to get this every single year and it's going to change, you know, just like the flu vaccine does, like, I don't know what kind of protection that's going to give me. And I'm mm-hmm. basically signing up for this untested product or they'll say it's tested, but not very good testing oh, right. um, because right. it's, you know, such a rushed fast track product. Oh, oh yeah. And and the government has done, done such a great job at, or I shouldn't say the government, I should say more of the media mm-hmm. have done such a great job at instilling fear that I'm worried that the world won't care whether this vaccine is safe. If it's even going to be slightly effective, please give it to me. Who cares about the side effects? Because, oh my gosh, you know, if I ever catch COVID-19, I'm Mm -hmm. totally going to die for sure. So who cares if there are side effects from this vaccine? That's what I think a lot of non-critical thinkers will believe. And and that's what I think, you know, who this... uh, who this publication is, I think, uh, preaching to is the non-critical thinkers. I, I think what people might think is, oh, 95%, that's fine. 95%, uh, we, we, we have that already with our childhood vaccines like measles and stuff, so we can get there. I think what people are not understanding is we don't have 90% vaccine coverage of the population. We have it in childhood populations that right, are enrolled right. in school. That's a very small subset of our total population. We do not have 95% vaccine coverage for anything right. in our country. Right, because it all wears off. All the shots you got as a child, for many people, it, it wears 100%. off. 100%. And then you've got the flu vaccine is the only vaccine that is, let's say, the most widely used across the population, mm-hmm. adults, children, whatever. And that is 47%. 47% of the United States opts in to the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. And you know how hard they market that flu vaccine? They are desperate as heck because they give it away for free. They give you coupons on your your Mm -hmm. purchase at CVS if you get it. Uh, They give them the government's purchasing, you know, millions and millions of doses just to make sure they can give them out. They advertise everywhere. It's they use shaming techniques. There's they've done everything they can to get that flu vaccine uptake higher. Their goal is about 80%, they said. So, they're at 47% with this crazy amount of money that they put into it. What they're telling you, what the New York Times mentioned in an article I covered about the COVID vaccine needing 95%, they want 95% of the world. Hmm. That is 7.4 billion people. You would need 7.4 billion doses for it to, quote, work. It will never happen. It will never happen. It's physically impossible. And oh my God, if you have to do this every year, there's just no way. Yeah. yeah. And think of all the hundreds of billions of dollars they're going to pour in to making all those vaccine factories mm-hmm. and, and to make the vaccine. And to advertise it. Right. And then and then is it is it going to be the sort of thing that that um, the governments are going to you know buy all the vaccines and then force them on everybody? So it's not like pharma is even going to have to market it. And it's not like it's going to be, you know, um, super expensive. Uh, I mean, I, I think if if they're setting up all this production, I don't know if it's going to be a, a huge cash cow for pharma or if they're just basically devoting part of our economy to producing all these factories and it's going to be like government run. I, I don't even know. Well, I, I, I doubt anybody's doing this without some type of profit involved, but I think whoever's got know. the patents on these things and whoever is getting percentages of certain things, there's money. There has to be money involved somewhere. Yeah, but there's going to be so many different brands mm-hmm. of this. Um, I mean, it's going to be amazing, but but my, my point is we're going we're gonna to spend so much money on this and in an economy that's already collapsed. Totally. And is it even wise to devote hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide to try to make a vaccine that might not even work? By the time it's approved, will we even need it? Will we have some pretty good natural herd immunity by then? 
will the virus mutate and change? So whatever vaccine we've spent a hundred billion, a hundred mm-hmm. billion dollars creating, maybe that vaccine is no good anymore. Um, if if wise heads were prevailing, I think we might think about figuring out if that's a wise use of hundreds of billions of dollars at this point in time. Of course. Well, in this article, it says that exact thing. They have that tweet there. It says Canada pledges more than $850 million to medical research, international vaccine development, and the WHO's work on vaccine, the World Health Organization. So they're already putting almost a billion dollars that they are pledging Money they probably don't have. And that's just one country. That's one country. But this is money that should be going to all the citizens that lost their small businesses and are now in poverty and unemployed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It absolutely is not wise. Yeah, that's something, I mean, I never even thought about this until until I, I glanced at that. Every single, you know, country's economy worldwide is 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 on the downturn and many economies are going to totally collapse. Everyone's going to be out of money. The government is giving away free money to its citizens, but no one's working, so no one's paying taxes. So the government's just just bleeding money left and right. They're now going to give billion, you know, Canada's going to give almost a billion dollars. Other countries are going to give tens of billions. Hundreds of billions of dollars are going to go to who? They're going to go to pharma. They're going to go to pharmaceutical companies to build factories, start researching, to research and develop a vaccine. And the governments are giving them the money. So pharma is not even having to use their own money to make this vaccine now. Right. It, it's our taxpayer money oh, right. that, that is funding this. So that's why I kind of I kind of thought if if this is all government funded, it might not be something that farm is necessarily going to make all this money back on it's you know it's, it's the governments are going to have to recoup all their money on but is that a wise way to spend money i don't know that it is right now if we took that hundred billion dollars that you know bill gates and others want us to put into developing a covid vaccine if we just put all that money back into um Local economies, uh, you know, uh, buying food for people, getting people back to work, infrastructure, helping people live healthier lives. If we put that much money into our society and and totally left the vaccine alone and we all learn how to weather this disease and make us healthier, wouldn't that be a better idea than than, you know, crashing our, our economy by another $100 billion worldwide just to, again, just to make a vaccine that might not actually even work. And that's $100 billion we don't have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from this unicorn yeah. fund, yeah. <laughs> this invisible poof magic place where yeah. money just comes so, from that we didn't have to fix the problems we already had before COVID. Yeah. But now all of a sudden we've got a factory that produces money that we can just yeah. use to fix and make other factories to make things <laughs> that don't make sense. Yeah, yeah. So I... I I don't know why people aren't looking that far ahead or looking at this as, I mean, yeah, it's like, of course, a vaccine has to be the answer. The vaccine has to be the answer that's going to save the world. That's what people think. But what if that's not the answer? Other people have said that's not the answer. The Surgeon General just said just good public health measures and, and smart decisions and and uh, healthy immune systems and living healthy and eating well, that's going to be the answer to any infectious disease, mm-hmm. as it always has been going back. And this vaccine could be the most expensive vaccine anyone's ever made. Because, I mean, if you look at it, um, only one company makes uh, the measles vaccine in the United States. So they, they had to develop the vaccine, but it's not like there was a race mm-hmm. or the world spent, you know, $100 billion to make the measles vaccine. No. A company researched it in other countries, other companies research it, but they slowly developed it, you know, via proper measures, step-by-step science, animal testing, you know, very extensive safety testing. That's the classic way to develop a vaccine. The way we're developing coronavirus vaccines, I read there's over a hundred companies racing to make a coronavirus vaccine all government funded, all these governments are pouring the money Mm -hmm. in. Maybe some of it is privately funded as well, but that's where all our money is going. Like you said, money we don't have, Mm -hmm. is that wise? And as a citizen, if you don't think that's wise, you might start speaking up, even though in today's climate, it might be politically incorrect to speak out against, you know, 
trying to develop a coronavirus vaccine. And that's what, not what I'm saying. We, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to develop it. I'm saying we shouldn't pour a hundred billion that we that no one has into mm -hmm. developing it. We should slow down and develop it properly using the scientific method, not like a pharmaceutical race uh, driven by fear to correct, you know, to create a crappy vaccine that has bad side effects that we're going to force on everybody. And meanwhile, we should be teaching citizens how to weather the virus yeah. so that you're going to catch it. You might mm -hmm. as well have a mild case. Here's how you do it. That's what yeah, they should be yeah. doing in the process, making you know our, yeah. our population healthier yeah. so that viruses aren't likely to give us a complication. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, you want to turn this into two parts yeah, yeah, and we'll I go got, into I our second thing? See, I told you it was going to be super. No, that's cool. okay. And so <laughs> we're going to end our part one here and we're going to go into part two that talks about exactly how the government is going to do it. Yeah. How will yeah. they do it? How will they mandate the vaccine? What will that look like for you? So we will start with part two covering that part of it. Thank you guys for listening, as always, yep. on the Vaccine Conversation, and we will be right back. <laughs> or catch you next time. Oh, that's what you always no, say. I'm like, yeah, there is some sort of catchphrase. <laughs> we'll be right back. What are we on, the, like a TV show? Yeah. We'll, we'll be, be right after back these, after this. <laughs> after these, the word from our sponsors that we don't have. All right, you guys, take care. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. It is not intended as medical advice. Always consult your healthcare professional for information on vaccines and infectious diseases.